It's now my immense, immense pleasure to introduce one of the great highlights of this year's marathon, the most distinguished, extraordinary, world-renowned Martin Rees. We are extremely, extremely delighted to welcome Martin on stage. He is a professor at Cambridge University and has the title of Astronomer Royal. He is also the member of the House of Lords. He has a long-standing pioneering interest in cosmic evolution and a long-term future, what Fernand Baudel calls la longue durée, and the hazards that might be encountered due to the growing footprint of humans on the planet and the possible misdirection of advanced technology. His books have been key inspiration for this marathon from the very, very beginning, to mention a few, our final century, just six numbers, and from here to infinity. We recorded several conversations with Martin, um, parallel to the conversations we had with Gustav preparing the marathon, and I'd like to just quote twice here from this conversation. Martin told us each person in the world is more demanding of resources and of energy and impacting more on the biosphere. So this is the first century in the history of the world where one species, the human species, can determine the future of the planet. And this is something which is a huge opportunity, but also there is a huge downside if we get things wrong. In the second conversation, Martin told us, there are some things we will never understand. They will have to wait post-human intellect. Please give a very, very, very warm welcome to Martin Rees. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a flashback to 1902. In that year, the young H.G. Wells gave a celebrated lecture at the Royal Institution. He spoke mainly in visionary mode. Humanity, he said, has come some way and the distance we have traveled gives us some earnest of the way we have to go. All the past is but the beginning of a beginning. All that human mind has accomplished is but the dream before the awakening. His rather purple prose still resonates today. But he wasn't an optimist. He also highlighted the risk of global disaster. Let me quote again. It is impossible to show why certain things should not utterly destroy and end the human story and make all our efforts vain. Something in space or pestilence or some great disease of the atmosphere, some trailing cometary poison, some great emanation of vapor from the interior of the earth or new animals to prey on us or some drug or wrecking madness in the mind of man. Where were Wells writing today, he'd have been elated by the amazing advances of science, but I think even more anxious about its downside. As he realized, some hazards come from beyond the Earth. Asteroid impacts, for instance. As an astronomer, you might expect me to talk about this, but I won't say much. There's about one chance in 100,000 that the people alive today will be wiped out like the dinosaurs, and a higher chance of smaller impacts occurring that would cause regional devastation. An asteroid, say 300 meters across, if it fell into the Atlantic, would produce huge tsunamis that would devastate the east coast of the US as well as much of Europe. But the asteroid risk isn't what keeps me awake at night, because it's not getting any higher. Indeed, it's getting lower because we will learn soon to predict and even deflect potential impacts. What keeps me awake are the risks that humans are causing, which are growing all the time. And as Hans Ulrich mentioned, I wrote a book 10 years ago on this theme, which I entitled Our Final Century? Question mark. The publishers left out the question mark, and the American publishers changed the title to Our Final Hour. I guess Americans like instant gratification and the reverse. Well, my theme in this book was that our Earth is 45 million centuries old, but this century is the first when one species, namely ours, can determine the biosphere's fate. 
That's because of a rising population of humans, or more demanding of resources, or more empowered by technology. We're deep in an era that's sometimes called the Anthropocene. And these human-induced threats are of two kinds. The first stem from the collective imprint of us all. Nine billion people by 2050, maybe 11 billion by the end of the century. Their quest for food, resources, and energy will threaten our finite planet's ecology and transgress the boundaries of sustainability. And indeed, as we've heard from others, worst-case scenarios predict ecological shocks and mass extinctions that could irreversibly degrade the biosphere. And it's important to recognize that we depend on these ecosystems, but they surely have value in themselves, quite apart from their benefits to us humans. It's our ethical imperative to preserve them. Now, climate change, again caused by us, aggravates the challenge and could plainly be devastating if the more pessimistic projections are borne out. My pessimistic guess is that political efforts to decarbonize energy production will continue to be torpid rather than effective, and that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere will rise at an accelerating rate for at least the next 20 years or so. But by then, we'll know for sure just how strongly the feedbacks from water vapor and clouds amplify the effect of CO2 in ex exciting a greenhouse effect. If the amplification is strong and the world seems on a rapidly warming trajectory into dangerous territory, then I think there will then be a pressure for panic measures. These would have to involve a plan B being fatalistic about continuing dependence on fossil fuels, but combating its effects by what's called geoengineering. And this is feasible. We can throw enough material into the stratosphere to change the world's climate. Artificial volcanoes, as it were. Indeed, what's scary is that a single nation could do this, even a single corporation. And geoengineering, if ever done, will be an utter political nightmare. Not all nations would want to adjust the thermostat the same way. There'd be unintended side effects. The only beneficiaries would be the lawyers. Because if you can blame someone for the weather, there's endless scope for litigation and international disputes. Well, the science of weather prediction is hard, but a doddle compared to the politics. And the reason nothing is achieved is because the long-term and global always are trumped by the urgent and parochial, and indeed by things before the next election. Where so much for climate and the environment, I want, in the rest of this talk, to focus on a second kind of threat to our civilization, which is this. Technology renders us more vulnerable in many ways. I'm thinking not just of nuclear, because we already depend on all kinds of elaborate networks. Electric power grids, GPS, just-in-time delivery, globally dispersed manufacturing, and so forth. And unless these networks are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare, disruptions cascading through the system. Real-world analogs of the 2008 financial crash. London will be instantly paralyzed without electricity. Supermarket shelves will be bare within a day or two if supply chains were disrupted. Air travel can spread a pandemic worldwide in days, causing the gravest havoc in the shambolic megacities of the developing world. And social media can amplify panic and rumor literally at the speed of light. And the worry is not just accidental breakdowns, maliciously triggered events, very hard to foresee and prevent, can have catastrophic consequences. And I worry especially about future biotech, 
It offers, of course, bright prospects, but the risks are already looming. Last year, some researchers in Wisconsin and in Holland showed it was surprisingly easy to make an influenza virus more virulent and transmissible. Such experiments are a scary portent of what's to come. What would happen if scientists could make the Ebola virus transmissible through the air? Just this week, I'm glad to say, the American government announced it would stop funding such experiments. About time, too, in my opinion. Looking further ahead, the physicist Freeman Dyson foresees a time when children will be able to design and create new organisms, just as routinely as his generation when young played with chemistry sets. This scenario may stay as science fiction, but were even part to come about, our ecology and even our species surely would not survive unscathed for long. And my worst nightmare of all is an echo fanatic, empowered by biohacking expertise that may be routine by 2050, someone who thinks that our world, Gaia, can only be saved if the human population is reduced by a few billion. Now, regulation to ensure that we don't do these dangerous things can never be enforced worldwide, any more than the drug laws can be enforced. I fear that whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And the worry is not just biotech, though that's, I think, the worst. All technology will become ever more empowering. And error or terror, even triggered by tech-savvy individuals, will be ever more devastating. The global village will have its village idiots, and they will have global range. What about robotics and AI? These are advancing so fast that we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to prospects that may now seem science fiction. We may need to guard against dumb autonomous robots going rogue, or a hypercomputer with analytic powers offering its control of dominance of international finance. And some seriously fear what could happen if a machine developed a mind of its own especially if it could infiltrate the internet and the coming internet of things and construct even more powerful successors. So technology brings with it great hopes, but also great fears. We surely have a bumpy ride through this century. But although this is bad enough, are there conceivable events that could be even worse, events that could snuff out all life? and not just set it back. Promethean concerns of this kind were raised by scientists working on the atomic bomb during World War II. Could we be absolutely sure that a nuclear explosion wouldn't ignite all the world's atmosphere or oceans? Before the first bomb test in New Mexico, the great physicist Hans Bethe addressed this issue. He concluded that there was a large safety factor and luckily, he was right. But what about even more extreme experiments? When CERN's LHC in Geneva came online, generating unprecedented concentrations of energy, some anxiously asked, could it destroy the Earth? Fortunately, reassurance could again be offered. Indeed, I was one of those who calculated that, the, that nature has done more extreme experiments all the time. Cosmic ray particles in the galaxy crash together with much higher energies than we can achieve even in the LHC, and they haven't ripped space apart. Nonetheless, physicists should surely be circumspect about doing experiments which create conditions with no precedent anywhere in nature, just as biologists should avoid release of potentially devastating modified pathogens. But there is we must accept a genuine tension here. Undiluted application of the precautionary principle has a manifest downside, because if we take no risks, we may forego disproportionate benefits. As Freeman Dyson argued in an eloquent essay, there is, I quote, the hidden cost of saying no. We need to develop guidelines that achieve the right balance. 
the probability of any of these truly existential risks may seem infinitesimal. But the priority we should assign to avoiding them depends on an ethical question, which is this, something philosophers have addressed. Consider two scenarios. Scenario A, A wipes out 90% of humanity. Scenario B wipes out 100%. How much worse is B than A? Some would say 10% worse. The body count is 10% higher. But others would say that B was incomparably worse because human extinction forecloses the existence of billions, even trillions, of future people, humans and perhaps post-humans. Especially if you accept this latter viewpoint, you would agree that existential catastrophes, even if you'd bet a billion to one against them, deserve more attention than they're getting. And in order to guard against these risks, some of us in Cambridge, both natural and social scientists, have started a research program, which we call the Center for the Study of Existential Risks, which is going to try to assess how to enhance resilience against any credible risk of this kind. Let me look beyond the Earth for a minute. By 2100, groups of pioneers may have established bases independent from the Earth on Mars, or maybe living on an asteroid. This diaspora, of course, would ensure that advanced life would survive even if the worst conceivable catastrophe befell our planet. And whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these adventurers good luck in genetically modifying their progeny to adapt to an alien environment. And they may then be making the first step towards divergence into a new species, the beginning of the post-human era. And astronomers know that there's more time lying ahead, more billions of years, than have already elapsed on the Earth. So any creatures who witness the sun's demise six billion years from now, they obviously won't be human, but they'd be more different from us than we are from a bug. There's more time between now and then than it's taken for the entire panoply of Darwinian evolution. But even though people will go into space, I think, by the end of the century, some people now living will walk on Mars, don't ever expect mass emigration from Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. Space doesn't offer an escape from the Earth's problems. We've got to solve them here. We're all on this crowded world together. Spaceship Earth is hurtling through space. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdowns. And there's too little planning, too little horizon scanning to minimize long-term risk. And we shouldn't be complacent. Humans have indeed survived for millennia, despite storms, earthquakes, and pestilence. But the threats I've mentioned are different. They're newly emergent, so we have a limited time base for exposure to them. And we have zero grounds for confidence that we can survive the worst that the future can bring in its wake. It's an important maxim that the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. But we mustn't go from denial to despair, nor let these anxieties put the brakes on all progress. We need more technology, but better directed technology, and technology guided by values that science itself can't provide. And I'll conclude with some words from the great biologist, Peter Medawar. I quote again, the bells that toll for mankind are like the bells of alpine cattle. They're attached to our own necks, and it must be our fault if they don't make a tuneful and harmonious sound. Thank you.